is uh, Mike Considine. Then Mike is going to give us a paper in tribute to John Bond. <coughs> Sorry, I forgot to press the microphone again. John Bond was a, a regular presenter at, at these um, symposia, and indeed he had prepared a paper for uh, Hazards 21, but alas, he's no longer with us to present the paper. So instead, we've invited um, Mike Considine yeah, to present a paper in tribute to John Bond. Uh, Mike Considine has worked in the field of major hazards for more than 30 years, including spells in the chemical, nuclear, and insurance industries. He has been with BP for the last 20 years, where he is currently head of the major hazards and fire team. He is chairman of the ICME Safety and Loss Prevention Subject Group and secretary of the EFCE Loss Prevention Working Party and a trustee of the Hazards Forum. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Mike. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I guess many of you will have known John Bond personally uh, and uh, have known what a wonderful uh, individual he was, but I'm sure that everybody within this theatre would have known of, uh, of, of John's reputation uh, and his professional expertise in the area of safety and loss prevention. Um, John had a particular passion around uh, uh, the industry learning from accidents, and we've seen this afternoon just how important that actually is. Uh, so John was one of the pioneers uh, in, in developing and championing the ICME uh, uh, accident database, but recently he became very interested in what other industries were able to do in this field to, to learn from, uh, from the lessons that they'd uh, uh, passed incidents. And um, uh, John submitted a paper on, on his research to Hazards 21, and um, of course it was accepted because John always produced very high quality stuff. Um, but regrettably, uh, John passed away in the summer of this year, and, uh, and Mike Adams kindly asked me if I'd be prepared to uh, present John's uh, paper as a tribute to John. Uh, so I, say, I, I must say I'm, I'm very highly honoured to, uh, to do that. I hope I can do John's uh, thinking justice. Uh, but I think it's a really fitting tribute to John that we will all go away uh, from the conference. Um, you know, our last thoughts are uh, uh, associated with pearls of wisdom that have been provided by John himself. So, so that's a really nice way to, to finish the conference. So I just want to, uh, to, to run through a, a sort of an introduction and the background to the importance of, of this topic. And then to, uh, then to talk a little bit about um, risk management in the aviation industry. So John really saw the aviation industry, if you like, as a model, um, uh, a, a sort of an area of excellence uh, in, in terms of learning from accidents. And so he looked to that and, uh, and was looking to see, could we bring some of the thinking back into the oil and petrochemical industry? Uh, so, so we're going to look at that, the thinking that, that, yes, the similar ideas could be applied back into our industry. And then just to summarize the key findings. So the background to, uh, uh, to, to, to learning from accidents, really, I mean, the first thing that, um, that the industry is charged with under, under the sort of coma regulations is to, uh, is to uh, identify and assess risks and demonstrate that uh, ultimately we're managing those risks to as low as reasonably practicable. Um, and to do that sort of initially requires um, a knowledge of the risk associated with the design of the facility. So, so when we design a, a facility, we'll, we'll be looking to identify what potential uh, things could go wrong with the, with, with the operation and what the associated risks are. But I guess, as we know, uh, as in practice, things don't always work out exactly as we planned. And so when we move through into the operational phase, it's important to keep monitoring how we are performing in terms of, uh, in terms of level of risk. And um, obviously, with major accidents, uh, you know, the answer isn't to sort of monitor it by measuring the performance, because uh, you know, hopefully, we won't have any major accidents. So, so how do we monitor how we're doing? And um, of course, one of the ways that we can do that is to monitor the sort of precursors to major accidents, um, and so sort of uh, uh, chase those uh, precursors and try and minimise those, so that hopefully, we can minimise the risk of having the accident itself. So this was pretty much John's thinking that we could get after looking at the precursor initiating events 
And if we could analyse the frequency and potential severity of those events, we could focus our, our, our mitigation efforts uh, around, around that thinking. So John suggested that we, we look at the aviation, aviation industry and, and, and see what they were doing and see if we could learn from them. And, and again, I think probably most of us recognise that they are a sort of, um, you know, centre of excellence in, in, in this area. Um, you know, and I think the key for that is that, uh, you know, the information on um, incidents in the aviation industry is sort of shared internationally. Um, you know, whenever an incident happens, it's thoroughly investigated. And as much learning is extracted from that, and then that's fed back to the industry worldwide. And, uh, you know, this takes quite a challenge because it does require that you have the right sort of culture in the, in the industry. Um, so a no-blame, just culture is very important. So that people can feel uh, free to... Uh, people can feel free that they, they can actually admit to mistakes and, and that they can feel comfortable in, uh, you know, that the performance is being monitored, uh, if only to learn from mistakes, not to, not to blame people. And as I said, you know, the, 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 uh, the success, is, again, is, is exemplified by uh, the fantastic sharing across all, across all companies and across all countries. Um, now, what, uh, what's interesting about the, uh, the graph in, in, in this uh, slide is that we can see that uh, worldwide over the years, you know, the, uh, the aviation industry, at least for fixed wings, has continued to show a steady decline in its um, accident rate. But uh, what's also particularly of interest is on this, on this slide is, is the, uh, the benefit that's been afforded by the use of flight data recorders. And so you'll see the, uh, the sort of three, uh, the three dotted lines that show how the, uh, the use of flight data recorders has had a significant uh, impact on reducing the, uh, the, the level of losses in the industry. And what's also interesting is it's not just the use of uh, data recorders per se, but, uh, but the slide also shows that as the experience and, and uh, long-term usage of these data recorders is in place, so the performance gets better and better. So the slide shows that uh, you know, as compared to those um, uh, airlines that have been using flight data recorders for sort of a relatively short period of time, say less than seven years, we can see that where it's been in place for a longer period of time, uh, you know, over 14 years, then there's a much better performance improvement. So, so it's a case of, yeah, introducing the idea and sticking with it because the benefits are actually cumulative. So the same situation wasn't necessarily in place with helicopter operations. And um, what, was, uh, what was thought to be of interest was uh, a trial was applied to uh, 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 helicopters that were servicing North Sea oil operations back in 2002-2003 um, to see if um, the same sort of thinking that uh, was there for flight data recorders in fixed-wing aircraft could also be a benefit to helicopter operations. And at the time, um, the, the, um, the existing, there were existing systems in place to monitor uh, the performance of helicopters, but the, the, the systems were very much focused around monitoring technical performance. So, for example, monitoring um, uh, engine temperatures or, um, or vibration on the rotors and the like. So that will be monitored, but wasn't, wasn't being monitored was the uh, actual uh, actions taken by the pilot or the environmental conditions and so on. And this is the sort of thing that will be captured in a, in a conventional flight data recorder. So um, there was this trial carried out on helicopters to extend the, uh, the technical uh, monitoring to cover the, the same sort of things that would be covered in fixed-wing flight data recorders. And as we'll see in a minute, there was actually a significant safety and, um, and performance improvement that when, when this was applied. Um, so, in terms of uh, applying that sort of approach, um, one of the things that you, uh, you need to do is you need to understand uh, how significant uh, a deviation from normal operation is. Um, so, if, if um, you know, a pilot does something that takes, uh, takes something beyond the normal operating envelope, how serious is that and how close is it taking you to an accident? So, I just want to introduce this concept first of trying to 
look at the severity of, of any deviation and rank it. And, and th there is a scheme that they basically develop of ranking the severity of a, of a deviation from, from naught being of no significance whatsoever right through to level 10 where it actually led to an accident. So, so basically what, what happens is that uh, deviations are, uh, are, are monitored and measured along with the severity using this ranking scheme. And here's a, a, a sample of, uh, of the output um, end results. Don't, don't worry too much if you, uh, if you can't see the details in, in, in the picture. Uh, all I want to do is to sort of say that the, um, that the, uh, the graph really consists of um, frequency multiplied by severity of different types of incidents um, over different time periods. So each color in the, uh, in the bars represents a particular, uh, a particular month uh, over which the trial took place. And if you like, the, the total length of the bar is the sort of product of the frequency of the deviations and the severity. So, so basically what we're seeing is that the, uh, the longer the bar, then the higher the risk associated with that type of operational deviation. And what came out of this was that the most serious operational deviations, or the biggest risk ones, were in this particular case, um, associated with um, uh, exceeding taxing limits. And uh, basically, there's a danger that a helicopter would turn over uh, in those sort of situations. So by using this sort of information, they were able to target um, you know, those sort of issues that had the greatest severity and were posing the greatest risk. And just over the six-month period, um, they did notice that there was a, you know, a marked improvement in performance by applying this approach. So this graph actually shows um, two things. It shows the number of uh, deviations over the time period, declining over the six-month period, uh, which are the red bars. And, and the green line uh, shows the sort of uh, declining risk level, where, where we're looking at the frequency and the severity of the different types of incidents. So even within a short period, as much as six months, they were able to demonstrate this, uh, this approach that had been used for flight data recorders on fixed wing was, uh, was showing real benefits in the helicopter operations. So that's all well and good, but, but you know, John's thought was really, well, how do we bring this back into the petro petrochemical industry? And, and I guess the useful thing about that is, um, you know, so how does this all relate to the Swiss cheese model? And this is certainly not the first time you've seen this this week. Um, but um, but it, does, uh, it does give us a bit of a clue about uh, how the sort of uh, the concept would work. So, so basically... Um, what we're trying to do in, in this particular approach is we're trying to measure the size of the holes and the number of the holes in the cheeses and basically how close the cheeses are to the actual accident. So how close are we getting to an accident when we're looking at the deviations? So that's really what we're trying to do in monitoring the precursors. And as an example, John, John shows in his paper a few, a few potential examples. So, so, uh, you know, if one of the potential scenarios is overflowing of tanks, which has happened in Bunsfield, uh, then some of the, the precursors, if you like, are um, where uh, situations have happened where the, uh, the transfer hasn't been stopped at its normal uh, fill level, or, or there are situations where the, um, the uh, 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 trip has been allowed to operate and actually uh, stop the pump transfer. So if we could monitor the frequency of those sort of events, uh, you know, then we might be able to catch these things before, before the accident happens. So, so monitoring how often um, you know, uh, levels are filled above normal level and how often the alarm and trips operate, it, it would give us really useful information. And uh, the beauty of this in, in our industry is that We've done most of the work already. You know, the very fact that we've got HAZOPs and LOPERS means that we, we do understand the sort of deviations that can happen uh, in, in our processes. We do understand the potential consequences of, of those. Um, using LOPERS, we should be able to say how close we are to the accident. And so, uh, so we've got all the, all the building blocks in place already to really make uh, some really, really useful um, you know, some really useful approach uh, using this. Um, 
So if only we could start to monitor those sort of deviations that are identified in HAZOPs and, uh, and, and couple them with perhaps the severities that are associated with those event, those deviations that have been identified in HAZOPs, then, then you know, we might have a really powerful method of, of pushing this forwards. And um, you know, the other thing is that effectively with modern process control systems, we have a, a flight data recorder actually there if we want to use it. Um, so I guess you know, this is the real challenge. Um, you know, can we get to the situation where we can generate the right culture within our industry that we feel comfortable about recording and analyzing and using um, uh, deviations from normal operation, which we can extract from our, our sort of normal process control systems. So, so that's the challenge, I think. So John really saw this, you know, if we could overcome those difficulties, we would be into a, into a new approach, um, you know, where we could continuously monitor and uh, evaluate and correct um, our, our processes by measuring these precursors effectively through our, uh, our process control flight data recorder, if you like. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and as we've seen, you know, uh, in the helicopter operations, if we could get to that place, we might lead to, uh, you know, a real improvement in safety performance. So really, just to summarize, um, you know, the aviation industry has uh, used flight data recorders for a considerable period of time. And flight data recorders monitor, you know, all equipment performance, operator performance, and external conditions. And uh, this has allowed the industry to analyze the precursors to accidents. And by doing that, it's led to a demonstrated improved safety and operational performance. And if we could only bring that to our industry, we, we could re reap real benefits. But there is an issue on the cultural side where we do have to have a very much open and enlightened attitude to recording and sharing incident accident data and, and definitely moving away from any sort of blame culture. And clearly, we have the building blocks in place in terms of the processes and systems. So modern process control systems in, in our industry could allow us to do just the same as the aircraft industry in flight data recorders. So that's all I want to say. And um, you know, I think great thinking from John, again, real innovation. Let's hope we can make it happen. Thank you.